Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. What a crowd. What a crowd. Well, it's a great place, and I just want to say a very big hello to New Hampshire. You've been fantastic, and we've had, we've had tremendous success. It's great to be back in the proud home of the first-in-the-nation primary. Your first-in-the-nation primary. I wonder who kept you there. Trump. Trump. Less than three months from now, we're going to win the New Hampshire primary for a third straight time. And we're going to look at all these people up there. I didn't even see you. I didn't see you. From... Wow, what a group. And we're going to crush Crooked Joe Biden. He is a crooked man next November. And we're going to make America great again. We're going to make it great again. We have no choice. We have to. I want to thank our Sullivan County Trump Chair, State Representative, Jonathan Stone, wherever you may be, Jonathan. There's so many people. Jonathan, thank you very much. Thank you, Jonathan. New Hampshire Police Association Vice President Timon Ekua. I don't know if that's good or not, but I tell you what, it's the best. I Where is he? I'm very pleased to receive the endorsement of Sullivan County Commissioner Joe Osgood. We just got that. Thank you very much. Joe, where's Joe? Joe, thank you. Thank you, Joe. State Representative Kristen Noble, also Jim Kofold, and the 603 Alliance. I appreciate it. I appreciate the endorsements. We've had a lot of endorsements in New Hampshire. Almost everybody's endorsing us. Now they're, and now they're coming. The money's flowing in all those funders. They said, maybe, maybe we'll endorse somebody else with our money. And all of a sudden, they're calling. They say, uh, President, President, hi. I said, I thought you were going to be with the Sanctimonious. No way. No way, sir. I'll give you whatever you want, sir. It's an amazing phenomenon when you have the phenomena when you have great polls, right? But the polls have been great because of people like you. We appreciate it very much. And that we should do very well. And they've been very good against Crooked Joe Biden. We're leading in every swing state now, every swing state. We're leading by a lot. But as you know, today is Veterans Day, very, very special day. So, so let's express our eternal gratitude to every veteran in this room. And who's a veteran? Raise your hand, please. A lot of veterans up here, and every proud veteran across the great state of New Hampshire, you're very, very proud of, uh, of your heritage, of your state, and of uh, your military. Tremendous, uh, I think, proportionally, as many in New Hampshire, maybe more than any other state. We're also honored to be joined by the Gold Star family members of Marines who lost their lives in the Afghanistan horrible, horrible withdrawal. I got to know the the parents and the relatives of so many of them, and they're incredible people. We spent an evening in Bedminster listening to music, right? We listened to music. Oh, there they are. We had a good time. I said, I'll be with them maybe 15 or 20 minutes. We spent about three hours together, right? Looking up in the sky and seeing some beautiful signals coming down, right? The father of Staff Sergeant Taylor Hoover, Darren Hoover, where are you? You're here someplace? Yeah, there you are. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Darren. Beautiful Darren. Beautiful Darren. The father of Lance Corporal Kareem Nukui and Stephen Nukui, and the mother-in-law of Sergeant Nicole G. We have them all here today. We have them all, Trump 2024. Christy Shamblin. Christy, thank you, Christy, very much. Um, and we'll see you back there or someplace else, okay?
But we had — that was a great evening. Wasn't that wild, sort of? It, they started off very sad, and uh, we finished the evening, and it was a beautiful, beautiful tribute to them. Not to us, to them, right? So thank you very much. We'll do it again. We'll do it again. And we love you all, and we will never forget the sacrifice of uh, Taylor and Nicole and Kareem and the others. And uh, incredible what happened. You don't take the military out first. You take the military out last, right? And, and about 10 other things that we could name. You don't give up Bagram. And you leave from Bagram, not from the place they left from. Couldn't breathe. It was so tight, so crazy, so horrible what they did. The veterans who have served this nation in uniform and enlisted their lives in defense of their families, our freedom, and our great American flag. And when I'm back in the White House, we're all going back together. They will once again have the loyalty, the respect, and the support that they earned and they so dearly deserve. After years of scandal, betrayal, and neglect under the Obama-Biden administration, I signed the VA Accountability Act. They were trying to get it done for 59 years, and we got it done through Congress, believe it or not, so they can't cancel it out right away, allowing us to tell the sadists and people that didn't work and people that didn't love our, our, our wounded and are injured and are hurt. They were uh, terrible. They would treat them terribly, and you couldn't do a damn thing about it. They'd be in there, and they were sadists. They had people. This wasn't prime time for our people, and they weren't able to defend themselves. They had people that would really mistreat our veterans, and uh, we couldn't do a thing about it because of the laws, civil service and otherwise. You couldn't do a thing. They could be as bad as they wanted. They could do everything up to murder, and the way they treated some of these people were just horrible people. You couldn't fire them. And now we looked at them, and we took about 7,000 of them, and we said, you are fired. Get out. Get out. Get out. That was a big thing. And by the way, I don't know if you know it, but Biden wants to put them all back. Can you believe it? And these were the bad ones. These were the bad ones. We don't want to do that. We don't want to fire. We replace them with great people. They want to put them all back, all those people that are sickos. They want to put them all back. I also signed about 59 years they've been trying to get this one, VA Choice, which made it permanent so that the veterans can get medical care at the private health care provider of their choice so that you go in and you go in and you want to — you're not feeling well. And, you know, many people became terminally ill waiting. They'd wait for two weeks, two months, three months, four months, five months, six, seven months. And by the time they got to see the doctor, they were terminally ill. They could have been taken care of very quickly, very easily, you know, preventative care. The best thing about that is get it early. They got it early, but when they got to the doctor, it would be many months in many cases. So if you waited more than one day, we let you go to a private doctor, any private doctor. We paid the cost. We negotiated with them. We had fixed prices. I said, because those doctors, they know how to make money, don't they? Some of them are uh, money machines, and some are just really good doctors and really love everyone in this room and all of your relatives. And what happened is uh, we made a deal that nobody said could be made, and we got it passed in Congress, believe it or not. The Republican Congress did a great job with both of these, the accountability and this. And now you go, and if you have to wait online for more than a day, you go to a private doctor, you pick the private doctor, and they take care of you, and you live. And believe it or not, not that this was why I did it, because it wasn't, but you save a lot of money. It's actually a lot cheaper than letting somebody get sicker and sicker and uh, just uh, end up dying a horrible death. And people that were pretty sick, but not that bad, are better, and uh, it's been an incredible system. I understand they're trying to dismantle it under the Biden administration, and you would know better than I, but they're trying to dismantle that under the Biden administration. But under the Trump administration, we live by the motto, promises made, promises kept. I made that promise. And there is no more solemn pledge than a promise to America's veterans. The veterans are incredible people. So many people in this room. Unfortunately, with crooked Joe Biden in the White House, our veterans are once again being backstabbed and betrayed by their government. Crooked Joe gutted our historic VA reforms and fought to reinstate thousands and thousands, as I just said, of, 
uh, fired horrible employees. These are horrible employees that when we terminated them, uh, we said, get out of here, and they got out. But now they have a little bit of a lobby going, and they even want back pay. They treated our <laughs> veterans badly. And it looks like it's going to cost up to $200 million in back pay for people that were treating our veterans badly. But instead of wasting $200 million on the worst VA employees, when, and when I say bad, they're bad, when I'm president, I'll ask Congress to take up every penny of that money and add some to it, because we're going to build in your great state a brand new, beautiful VA hospital right here in New Hampshire. We're going to build it. We're going to build the most beautiful hospital. And it's going to be, uh, you know, you, you're just about, I hate to say this, you're just about the only state that doesn't have a VA hospital, but yours is going to be better, in, better than any of them. Well, I'll get involved in the real estate world. We'll start looking at the corners and we'll say, <laughs> we'll build a better one for half the price. Better than anybody, but you'll have it. And that's already on the drawing board. You're going to end up with your own hospital, which you really need. Tra people have to travel for hundreds of miles to go and get to a hospital, a VA hospital. I'll also make it a personal mission to completely eradicate veterans' homelessness in America. You know, we were doing a great job with it, and then a terrible thing happened. We were doing so well with it, and then these guys get in, and uh, they treat the illegal aliens just pouring, pouring into our country better than they treat our veterans. I mean, I mean, they stay in the best hotels. I don't even stay in those hotels. I say, don't stay there. They're, I tell my people, don't stay there. They're too expensive. They say, we can't, sir. They're being occupied by illegal aliens. Those owners are making a lot of money, but it's, it's just crazy. We don't treat the veterans. We don't treat our veterans right. In the past three years, Biden has spent over $1 billion to put up illegal aliens in hotels, some of the most luxurious hotels in the country. Meanwhile, we have 33,000 homeless American veterans. Can you believe it? And we were really alleviating that problem, and now they've given that totally up. Totally up. It's terrible. On day one, I'll sign an executive order to cut off Biden's spigot of money for the shelter and transport of illegal aliens, and we will redirect a large portion of the savings to provide shelter and treatment for our own homeless veterans. We love our veterans. We've got to take care of our veterans here. They're among our greatest people. Crooked Joe puts bureaucrats first and illegal aliens first. I will put veterans first and America first every single time. In addition to being Veterans Day, today is also Armistice Day. Did you know that? Armistice Day. And this is uh, an incredible number when you hear these numbers, but the anniversary of the end of World War I, a conflict that wrecked the entire world, really. I mean, large parts of the entire world and killed over 20 million people. Did you know that? 20 million people. 20 million people! And think of it, we have a guy in the White House who can't put two sentences together, <laughs> who couldn't find his way off this stage. And actually, he would be confused, because I think my audience behind me might be bigger than my audience in front of me. He would be saying, he'd be saying, what do I do? Where am I? He'd be saying, hey, this is sort of a strange speaking menu. I'm like in the middle of a room, and I'm looking back here. But he would say, what's this? You ever see he ends a speech? He has no clue how to get off. You got to stare there. You got to jump off the front, do anything. Just don't walk into a wall. He walks into walls. But this is the guy that we have ne negotiating with Putin and, right? And President Xi of China and Kim Jong un, who won't even talk to him. This is who we have in charge of nuclear. But this anniversary should remind us all of why it is so important to 
once again have a president who will deliver peace through strength. That's what we had. We had tremendous. We had all peace. We had, we had peace. We had a great, we had a great period of time. World War III has never been closer, in my opinion, than it is right now. And it wasn't at all close. We were never going to have it. Three years ago, we had, uh, we had everything under perfect control. Uh, Russia was treating us with respect. They would have never, ever gone into Ukraine. Uh, China would have never been talking about Taiwan. I mean, we had this — the whole thing was going really good. You know, if you ask me, when he pulled out — the way he pulled out of Afghanistan, Putin wouldn't have done it anyway. But the way he pulled out of Afghanistan, it said, Let's go. And, you know, everyone lost respect. We pulled out as cowards. It was a surrender. It was truly a surrender. We gave up $85 billion worth of equipment, these 13 great lives. And we had 38 people were obliterated. 38, they don't talk about them. They never talk about them. Uh, missing legs, in one case, two legs, one arm, and a half an arm. And just, just, obliterated, and nobody mentions those poor people. Should have never happened. Should have never happened. The people in the front row that I've gotten to know, incredible families, are just torn apart by gross incompetence. And uh, I tell you, it's uh, so sad to see. It would have been so easy. We had, we had something going. We called up the head of the Taliban. I told the story to you, but I called up the head of the Taliban. I said, uh, the press got on me for that. Look at all the press. Oh, it's so nice. The fake news. Fake news. Fake news. <laughs> but I spoke to the head of the Taliban, Abdul. And then I told him, Abdul, you can't do this. You can't you keep shooting us. So they killed a lot of, a lot of soldiers, snipers, during the Obama slash Biden. I don't know. Did they ever call him? Uh, but they killed a lot of people with the snipers, a lot of people, period. And I said, you can't do it. Anyway, since I, I was, had a rough conversation with him, since that conversation, we didn't lose one. 18 months it was. We didn't lose one soldier. There wasn't one soldier shot at. 18 months. Even Biden admitted that. He said, well, I will say one thing under the Trump policy. They didn't lose any soldier. When he said that, his people went crazy. Don't say that. Why? But he did say that once. So I think we have to, we'll have to wheel out. We'll have to wheel out that statement. But it's true. I mean, look, for 18 months, think of it. 18 months, we didn't lose one soldier. So that we have inflation and we have high taxes and we have high interest rates and you can't buy a home and you can't refinance your home and you can't sell your home, and you have energy at the highest level it's ever been. You were energy independent three years ago. You had $1.87 a gallon gasoline, and now you have $5 gasoline. But I stand before you today as the only candidate in either party who can make this promise. I will prevent, 100 percent prevent, World War III. You're going to end up you're going to end up in World War III. If you look at what's going on right now in the Middle East and Ukraine, and you add it up, and we have somebody that has no clue what the hell is going on, you're going to end up in World War III because of this. No reason for it. Millions of people will die. I know the players. I know the job. I alone, in this primary, have borne the burden of having troops in harm's way as Commander-in-Chief of the U.S. Armed Forces. and. The neocons, globalists, and warmongers, and the race, they like to talk tough. Oh, we're going to go here, we're going to go there. Millions of people die, and we didn't do that. Yet, we knocked the hell out of ISIS. You know, I defeated ISIS totally and brought them back. But these people are way over their heads. Biden is over their head. I mean, Biden, in all fairness to the Republican, candidates, Biden, if you call that, look, what kind of a candidate? They're losing by like 60, 70 points each. Even they agree I shouldn't go to the debates. I mean, the other day, two of them said, well, if I was in his position, I don't think I'd debate either. But uh, how, about, how about this guy, Asa Hutchinson, right? He's been at zero for the last three months. Now, do you think he's going to surge to 90? 
I call him Ada, Ada. Ada Hutchinson. No, no, he's been at zero, zero, for the last three months. He didn't make the last debate because he had zero. How about that? You have a large population voting. He got absolutely no votes. So he gets no votes, and he says, and today I just heard his campaign manager quit. Why did he quit? Because I've been telling the guy to quit, and he won't quit. I think this, if he ever made it, it would be the single greatest comeback in the history of politics or any other event. You could say politics or any other event. If he made it, if he made it, it's only because he'd be the only one left on Earth. <laughs> guy was me. And he's a nasty guy, you know? He talks like he's terrible. He's a lousy governor, too. To me, peace through strength is not just a political slogan. It's actually a moral duty. And it's my commitment to you, the American people, but you will not have World War III. You know, we were respected when I was president. We were respected by China. You know, one story, a quick story. You don't mind if I go off teleprompter like a lot, do you? So much more exciting. So much more. But the head of Hungary, a very tough, strong guy, Viktor Orban. Did anybody ever hear of him? Probably, you know, considered very powerful, very uh, powerful within his country and outside of his country. Uh, not exactly loved by some of the European nations because he does his thing. He didn't allow millions of people to invade his country. He allowed nobody to invade. The zero, zero. He had nobody. So he doesn't have crime and he doesn't have the problems that they're having in other countries where millions of people are allowed to go in. But they uh, were interviewing him two weeks ago and they said, uh, what would you advise President Obama? The whole world seems to be exploding and imploding. And he said, it's very simple. He should immediately resign and they should replace him with President Trump, who kept the world safe. And I'm not just talking the United States. China respected him. Russia respected him. North Korea respected him. And he used another word other than respect, too. He said fear, but I don't want to use that word. Of course, it's probably better than respect if you get right down to it, right? But he said everybody was fine. We had no problem. We have none of these problems. You didn't have inflation. You didn't have these problems three years ago. And then you look at this. We had the greatest economy in history. Now we have a mess. You'll end up in the Great Depression. And I'll tell you the one thing I don't want to be, I don't want to be Herbert Hoover. I always said, I don't want to be Herbert Hoover. And the way they're going with their stupid energy policy highest in this state. You pay the highest energy costs anywhere in the United States. You know that? You ought to talk to your governor about that. You ought to talk to your governor. Who, who right now, I don't think he could be elected dog catcher. Here's a guy, here's a guy. And you may have a couple of fans, but I doubt it. Here's a guy, could have been a senator, would have been greatly helpful if he could have been. He's got the heritage of the name. He used to like his father. His father used to treat me very nice. He was actually nasty, and then when I won, he was, he went from one of the worst to one of the best. When I won, his father was great. Uh, before that, he was nasty. You know, he was a Bush guy. I mean, one of those things. They tend to be a little bit bad. Don't get a lot of the right things done. But his father was very, very good to me, and this guy, he could have been a senator, but he, you know he ran for president, right? He just didn't have the guts to announce it. He ran for president, and he was mired at 1% for a few months, making really nasty, he's a nasty guy, making nasty comments, and then he decided that he wasn't gonna run. So he said, well, I decided not to run. Well, he ran for like four months, he was running. But again, it takes courage. You know, say what you want about these other people, some of them shouldn't be running because it's a joke. But, but, you know, say what you want about them. It takes courage to run. It does. It takes courage. It's not an easy thing to do. But this guy could have been a senator, would have made a tremendous difference, and said they lost that race by a very close race. Uh, but they lost that race. But he could have been so easy. He could have been there because he's not presidential material. And he could have been there for a long time. And it would have made a big difference in the Senate. But he didn't do that. And people have to get, the Republican Party, they have to get unified and they have to get smart. They have to get smart. But say what you want about the Democrats. They have horrible policy. 
you know, let's have open borders where millions and millions of people come in illegally into our country from prisons and from mental institutions and terrorists. Think of their policies. All electric cars, they don't go far. You know where you can — you can't get out of New Hampshire in an electric car. Where are you going? I'm going to Massachusetts. Well, uh, you better get yourself a gas turbine, because this car is not going to get you there. Well, you could if you stop about four times. Now, I want to go to Massachusetts, darling. I'm sorry, you can't do it. You're about, you know, 12 miles away. The whole thing is crazy. You know, they want to also — but we have a little time. You know, this is a nice day. You, you screwed up my whole day by putting this in the middle of the day. So you can't do anything in the morning because you don't have time. You can't do anything in the evening. Although, tonight, I'm going to the UFC fight at Madison Square Garden. Dana White. You know Dana White? The great Dana White. There's a guy I'd like to make my defense chief. I wouldn't call him my defense chief. I'd call him my offense chief. He'd be my offense chief. But he's done a great job. But, no, I'm going there tonight, so uh, at least you left me enough time for that. But, you know, it's a really a tribute. Here we are on a beautiful day, a beautiful day in New Hampshire, and you have a crowd, and you have thousands of people outside that couldn't get in. I said, did you put up a screen for them? They said, no. Now, you don't care about that, but they do, okay? You got the better real estate. But as president, I will restore American strength, power, and prestige, and I will make your country safe. I will be the peacemaker. You know, the peacemaker is okay. Hillary Clinton, Hillary Clinton, during one of the debates, she said, look at him, look at him. He's a warmonger. She's the one that always wanted war. It's the strangest people want war. You look at her, what the hell's war? I remember when LeBron James endorsed her. It was the greatest endorsement I've ever seen. Because he got on stage and she got up and she was like here, around here. And I said, that's not looking good. That's not looking good. I love that endorsement. She can have them. Under Biden, our adversaries see the weakness and the foolishness of America's leaders, uh, the stupidity, actually. And, uh, you know, like this whole electric car mandate, can you believe it? The, the cars, they're too expensive. I say very easily to find. It's so simple, though. I say, let's do a little bit more sophistication. Uh, they're too expensive and they don't go far. What else can you say? You know, it's true. Thank you for watching this video. Live Feed is an independent media platform that's not affiliated with any party or organization. Our only mission is to bring truthful and independent reporting. If you'd like to support our work, join our channel as a member and be the first to watch all new videos as soon as they come out. Additionally, as a member, you will have access to many exclusive features, including priority reply to comments, access to behind the scenes footage, as well as members only Q&As, polls, and more. Thank you for supporting independent journalism. People like you make it all possible. Live feed, news as it happens, worldwide. When President Xi sits across the table from Crooked Joe, can you imagine President Xi's like central casting? There's nobody in Hollywood that can play the role of President Xi. The look, the strength, the voice. We will begin immediately negotiation. And I say, I say, loosen up. I say, loosen up. I had a great relationship with him until COVID. Then I said, that's the end of that. But I did. It's good to have a good relationship with Putin and Xi and all these people. They have lots of nuclear weapons. And Kim Jong-un I had a good relationship with. He's a tough, smart guy. You know, when I call these people smart, the press always says, he said he was smart. I'm supposed to say they're not intelligent people. President Xi in China controls 1.4 billion people with an iron hand, no drug problems. You know why they have no drug problems? Death penalty for the drug dealers. Death penalty, right? You want to solve your drug problem? You have to institute a meaningful death penalty for drug dealers. A drug dealer, and you, by the way, you have it worse than any other state proportionately. I don't understand New Hampshire, for whatever reason, you have a worse drug problem per capita than any other state. Nobody's explained that. Maybe you talk to the governor about that also, by the way. Why is that? You have the worst drug problem per capita in the entire nation. 
You have an unbelievable fire department and police department. They do such a good job. They spend most of their time saving people from overdoses and other things. Your police here and your fire here are incredible. I have to tell you. I met a lot of them backstage. I said, uh, you know, they spend a lot of their time. They spent almost most of their time on that, but they're, they're incredible, the job. Yeah, you ought to talk to your governor about that because that's something that uh, something should happen. But you want to really stop it. You know, when I was in the White House, I would set up uh, blue ribbon committees and I'd get socialites. Everybody wanted to be on committees, right? You know, they'd call in from Park Avenue, from Fifth Avenue, New York. Oh, I'd love to be on the committee, any committee. Well, we're going to put you in a blue ribbon committee on stopping drugs and drug abuse and stopping the caravans from born. Oh, that's what's a caravan? They had no idea. And they'd sit around, very prestigious people, and they'd talk for a little while, and then they'd get on to society and social and where you're going to be tonight. I'm going to be dining at Le Cirque tonight. But, uh, you know, they go and, and it's not the way. You can't do it. The only thing they understand is force. And if you want to stop your problem, and you have the single biggest problem in the country, from what I see in New Hampshire, I don't know why, proportionately, you need the death penalty. If you give the death penalty to drug dealers, you will have no more problem. You will have no more problem. You know, we cut it down 21 percent. And that was great. I did that without doing this. When I was in China, and I told this story a couple of times, maybe you've heard it, but I was with President Xi, strong man. And uh, I said, you don't have a drug problem, do you? No, we don't have no drug problem. We don't have drug. He looked at me like, what the hell? Of course I don't. 1.4, think of it, 1.4 billion people, no drug problem. I said, what do you attribute that to? He said, uh, quick trial. I said, quick trial, what's quick trial? We give quick trial. We give very quick trial to drug dealers. If somebody's selling drugs, we give them a one-day, it's a one-day trial, they give them a trial, and if they're guilty, which I would say probably 120% of the time, they go. They're guilty approximately 120% of the time. Uh, but they execute, and they, uh, they have the death penalty for drug dealers. So now, if you're a drug dealer, you'll say, you know, I think I'm going to take a pass on this particular country. Let's go to the United States, where they don't even give you a summons, all right? They don't even, they don't do anything. And uh, that's why we have the problem. If you want to do the real job, and a lot of people, I, I just don't know if our country's ready for it, but what could be worse than losing, I think, 300, 350,000? You know, you don't hear those numbers. They always say 100,000. They've been saying 100,000 people for the last, what, 15 years, would you say? It's 100,000. Oh, yes, we lose 100. That's a lot of people. That you take your largest stadium and you fill it up twice, right? No good. But it's 100,000, they say. But even if it was 100, but it's not. It's 350,000 people you're losing and you're destroying your homes. You ever see what happens to a family, a father, a mother, when they lose their son or their daughter to drugs? That family is destroyed. Ten years later, they're destroyed. It's, uh, it can never be the same. And these people do it. The average drug dealer kills 500 people a year. Think of it. The average drug dealer, over the course of his or her life, will kill five. And I think that's a low number, but they say kills 500 people a year. And uh, they don't mention the families that are destroyed to go along with their children and seniors and everything else that are killed. I mean, a lot of people are killed, but you think of it in terms of young people. But the average one kills 500, so why wouldn't you do the death penalty? It's actually humane if you think about it. Why wouldn't you do it? As Singapore does the death penalty, they have no drugs whatsoever, no drugs whatsoever. Other countries do them, many countries do it, but they have no drugs whatsoever. And we're becoming a drug haven. You know, China, many years ago, was being taken over by much smaller countries because they were all drugged out on the poppy fields, the poppy, the drugs, heroin, different drugs. But they were all drugged out. The nation was drugged out. And then along came a very powerful leader. You know who that is? And he said, no more. And from that time, pretty much until now, they uh, They've been strong, but they were all drugged out, and uh, they were, I mean, our nation's becoming that way, okay? Our nation's becoming that way. You look at our nation, it's, uh, that you almost say, how does it survive when so many people are absolutely sick? 
from drugs and drug overdose and all of the things that go with it. Our nation, remember, China was taken over by many different forces, much smaller, much weaker than them. Now they're strong. But our nation's uh, not so much different. We have a large percentage of our people are drugged out and won't help us in terms of making America great again. We have to help them, and we should help them. But we could stop this scourge if we would do it properly. And just out of curiosity, it's interesting. We're all friends. The death penalty sounds harsh. Thank you very much. But the death penalty, it's, you know, it's funny. They say, oh, he's conservative. It's not that I'm conservative. I'm, I, have a, I have common sense. You know, I want to have a border. We want to have free elections. We want to have low interest rates. We want to have school choice. We don't want to have men play in women's sports. How about that one? You see a, a field hockey sport the other day, and they had a, a man went in, and he hit a shot so hard it knocked a girl's the whole thing. Nobody's ever seen anything like it. The, ball, the thing was going like three times what they would expect. Uh, and there are many, many stories. The weightlifting records are being beaten by hundreds of pounds. The swimming, they're setting records. And it's actually very demeaning to women. And you know, the amazing thing is that women and people, even on the teams, they don't want to talk about it because these radical left people have everybody spooked. You know, they indicted me because I complained about an election. Do you notice any difference in my tone? I don't think so. No, I've gotten even more so. Look what happened to our country. So I was just going to ask you, so death penalty sounds very bad, and who wants a death penalty? But you're never going to solve the problem. Never. Your blue ribbon committees and all of these crazy things, not, even if they got tough with law enforcement, that's not going to solve the problem. Not even close. So let's have a vote. Who would be in favor of the death penalty? Now, wait, don't, don't go yet. Knowing that it will solve the problem. It's not like, oh, gee, do you think it will? No, they'll head to another country. They'll do something. But uh, that's what they do. They head to, from China, they left for, for New York City and other places, OK? So let's go. Death penalty, no death penalty. So who would be in favor of the death penalty to solve? And, and just out of care, who would not be in favor? Because it's harsh. Who would not be? Okay, I can understand it. Look, I can understand But I see one hand out of thousands of people. Uh, she, are you a liberal? Uh, no. Okay, I understand it. It's, it's, a, tough, it's a tough thing. And, it, and you know what happens? They can get it wrong, too. They can get it wrong, and they can abuse the system. I've been abused. A lot of the people in this room have been abused. They can abuse... They can abuse the system. Uh, but I see one hand. Okay, so let me do that again, because that's right. Who would be opposed to bringing in the death penalty? You would? You, you, it's okay. Seriously, don't be afraid. Nobody's going to. We're not, we're not the Democrats where you, they're going to put you in jail because you speak up. Who would be opposed? I see three hands. I see one hand of a person down there is going like this, meaning she doesn't know, right? Yes. She sort of likes it, but it's a big step. So I see three and a half, okay? How about back here? Who'd be opposed? Who'd be opposed? All right, so you're probably talking 1%. You know, I mean, if you think about it, that's pretty amazing. And that's a real poll. Now, the government, if they did that poll, they'd charge a million dollars for it. It wouldn't be as accurate. You know that, right? We did it in about two minutes. Uh, but uh, if you want to solve the drug problem in the United States, really solve it. You have to bring back the death penalty for drug dealers. That's what you have to do. And you'll solve it. So whether you're a Democrat, a Republican, or independent, if you don't want your sons and daughters drafted to fight and die in distant foreign lands that many of you have never even heard of, if you don't want your nation wrecked, if you don't want your economy destroyed, if you don't want American blood and American treasure squandered in a needless global war, you see it. They never end. They go for years, 21, 22 years. In Afghanistan, think of it, 21 years, 21 years. Too bad it carried out that long. We were going to get out of Afghanistan. 
we were coming out of Afghanistan, you know, I'm the one that got it down to 2,500 troops, but I was going to keep Bagram. You know, Bagram is one of the biggest air bases in the world. Cost us billions of dollars years ago, billions and billions of dollars. Has the biggest, most powerful runways, meaning the thickest concrete of any place. I think it's eight feet. You know, I used to go, when I was building, I'd like to go four inches and I'd negotiate. Maybe we can do it for three and a half. These things are many feet thick. Most powerful, most powerful runways and everything else. And uh, they gave it back, they gave it all back. But you have to really, you have to put people that know what to do. And if you want to get back to where we have to go, you have to vote for a, a gentleman named Donald J. Trump. That's all I can say. That's all I can say. We'll turn it around fast. You know, somebody said, oh, but he'll be there for four years. He'll be there for four years. And somebody else could be there for eight years. Let me tell you, eight years. If it takes eight years, you don't want that person, okay? I said that. As soon as I said that, they never used that line of crap anymore. They said, I can be there for eight years and I'll solve. And then they realized that. I said, how about six months? Because most of this will be solved in six months. Some of it sooner. We'll be drilling a lot sooner than that. For four straight years under the Trump administration, I kept America safe. I kept Israel safe. I kept Ukraine safe. He would have never gone in. I mean, I did it through osmosis. I was safe. He was never going to go in. And I kept the whole world safe. It's like Viktor Orban said, great, great, smart, tough man, but a real leader. He said he kept the whole world. The whole world was safe. We didn't have any of these problems. Think of it. Go back three years. We didn't have any of these problems. And we had the greatest economy in our history. I completely obliterated the ISIS territorial caliphate. <laughs> completely wiped out ISIS. And it was supposed to take, you know, to wipe out ISIS. You know that. It was supposed to take years. I was told years. And we, uh, I went to Iraq. I met with the generals. I found a couple of generals I thought were fantastic. I was told it would take four years or we maybe couldn't do it. And uh, I said, how long, general? You know who the general is, right? Raisin Cane, General Raisin Cane. I said, I love you. If your name is Raisin Cane, that the, that's what I'm looking for. I want General Raisin Cane working for me. I love Raisin Cane. But I said to him, what's your name, general? He said, my name is Kane, sir, Kane. He said, what's your first name, Raisin? <laughs> I said, Raisin, that's what they call me, sir, Raisin Kane. I said, is that because you raised Kane? I guess that's what they mean, sir. I said, General, I think I'm gonna like you. <laughs> and I said to him, uh, how long will it take you to knock out ISIS? I went for that, I actually flew there. Uh, I, extreme bravery when I did that because I had to fly in Air Force One. We had to darken our windows. They said, sir, we're going to have to. We're flying over enemy territory. Think of it. We're there for 21 years with the best equipment in the world that we still have to darken our windows to fly in. But I figured, uh, let's do it. And they turned off all the lights inside and outside of the plane. I went up to the, cac to the cockpit, and I saw people that were better looking than Tom Cruise, OK? Because, you know, when you fly the president, they have the best. They take that best of the Air Force, the best of the — they take only the best. And these guys are like central casting. They could be movie stars. In fact, if I was ever an agent, I'd just hire these people. I'd make a fortune. <laughs> Boom. Crew cut. And I see the captain. I say, uh, how you doing, captain? I'm doing fine, sir. We'll be there, sir, in about 20 minutes. I said, captain, I don't see any lights outside. I don't see any lights in your cockpit. I don't see anything. Sir, we're just fine, sir. And he's surrounded by people that looked as good as him. I said, am I in a movie? He said, no, we don't have people like, they, they don't look like that in Hollywood. I say, he's Tom Cruise. I'm not insulting short people. I said, this guy's Tom Cruise, but much taller, okay? Then he goes, he goes, uh, sir, we'll be there in 15 minutes. I say, Captain, that sounds great to me. And I'm going, ah, because I haven't seen, there's nothing. 
And there are a lot of people back there. You know, they have operators, they have this, they have engineers. I never saw so many people on a plane before operating a plane, but it's Air Force One. So, you know, you say, that's okay. That's not our big problem. We have other problems. But they're all really fantastic, and they're really the top of the line, top in the world. So we're coming in, we're 15 minutes away, and uh, he then says, so we'll be 10 minutes and we'll be landing. I say, I still don't see any lights at all. And I do that. I, I like to sit with pilots and land planes. You know, I have a nice plane. And I sit sometimes with a pilot. It's beautiful to watch. And uh, so now we're five minutes away, and you have a machine that has a voice of a machine, but it actually sounds like a human, but the most beautiful voice you've ever heard. And it talks to you as you're landing. It tells you what's going on. Very standard. It's, you know, the highest grade equipment. Then I hear 1,000. That means 1,000 feet. 1,000 feet is very, a big plane like that, that's very low. That's like a 10-story building. That's not very high, right? And we're flying over like desert. I hear 1,900, 800, you know, as it's going down. It's going down like this. And everything's fine. It's going down, but I don't see any lights. You know, usually you see lights. You see LaGuardia. You see Kennedy Airport and you see lights in the distance, and you think, isn't that a beautiful sight? Well, we're going down, and I didn't see a damn light. They have all the lights turned. And they said, uh, 600, 500. It's an incredible voice, a computer voice, but it's so perfect. 400. I said, Captain, are we OK? <laughs> I'm sort of taking my I'm trying to pretend I'm, I'm fine. But I don't see a light, and I got these guys, and they're up there, and they're confident as a, sir, we're just fine, sir. So we'll be landing in a, about a minute, sir, a minute. Goes 300, 200. I still, there's not a light. It's dark. And I think there wasn't even a moon out that night. 200, 100. I'm 100 feet above the ground. I see nothing. And then you hear, pwa, 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 you know, we land. I say, it's a miracle. And you know what I said? I said to my staff right after I landed, am I allowed, because I showed great bravery, I thought, am I allowed to give myself the Congressional Medal of Honor? <laughs> I want to give myself because I showed great bravery. I said, give me a towel. Give me a towel. Come on. No, I showed great bravery. No, they said that wouldn't be a good idea. I'm only kidding. You know what happens now? The press will take that and they'll say, he decided. I had that, actually. I told this story once before. I'd say, the press said he wanted to give himself the Congressional Medal of Honor. <laughs> so you can't be too sarcastic with these people because they know it's, we're having a little fun. And uh, if you can have fun nowadays, it's not a lot of fun. But the press actually reported me for saying, I wanted the Congressional Medal of Honor. Can you believe it? From myself. Because they're fake news. Oh, yeah. They're... I got a couple of beauties up there. That story, that story will be told tomorrow. And the, the highlight of the story is that I demanded the Congressional Medal of Honor. I guarantee it. So when you read it, just go, fake news. Anyway. But I came out, and, and the doors open, and I'm greeted by it's good-looking group of people, a staff sergeant, a drill sergeant. He looked like a piece of granite, a general, another general, a colonel, group of people on the bottom. I go down, and that's when I met uh, General Raisin Kane, and he was the boss. And uh, they all said, uh, great to meet you. I shook their hands. Sir, would you like to rest? You know, it's a long trip, like 20 hours. I said, no, I don't have to rest. Now, if Biden were president at that time, I'd say, you know what he'd do? He'd rest for about four days. <laughs> then they'd turn around. Did you meet the president? No, he was sleeping the whole time. He, he spent three days sleeping, and then he turned around and went back and went immediately into the beautiful bedroom of Air Force One and went to sleep. This is not what we're supposed to have for a president. So I went down. He said, sir, would you like to rest? I said, I don't need to rest. Let's go. So we start a meeting. And I said, uh, how do we defeat ISIS? We've been fighting them for 21 years. We have the best equipment in the world. They hardly have equipment. They are great fighters, by the way, great fighters. They're natural fighters. That's what they do. For 2,000 years, they fight. 
They come down from the mountain. They can live in a crevice in the mountain. Don't forget, you know, you look at what they've won. It's amazing, but they these are great fighters. How do we defeat these guys? And uh, we said, we can do it. I said, how long would it take you? Now, I was told four years by a couple of our television generals in Washington. Oh, Millie, is Millie a beauty? But I was told it would take four years. Sure, it will take four years. Very big effort. So I asked, uh, I asked General uh, Raisin Kane. I said, General, how long would it take to do it? Sir, we can do it in four weeks, and I think we'll have time left, Oliver. I said, wait a minute. <laughs> For years, every, not me, everybody, you were hearing four or five, six years, and very hard to do. And now I have a guy sitting there that, that truly is central casting. And I'm sitting here, and he's saying, I can do it in four weeks, and he'll have time left over. So I say, how do you do that? He says, well, sir, when they came in from Washington, you know Mattis, General Mattis, uh, General Milley, real beauties. General Milley is the one that decided to take the soldiers out first, OK? General Milley is the one that said, let's leave $85 billion worth of equipment behind, because it's cheaper than taking it out. It's cheaper than putting a tank of nice, clean fuel in the airplane and flying it to Pakistan or flying it all the way home. It's cheaper to leave it there. We left them brand new planes, brand new helicopters, thousands of night goggles, better than the ones we have. These are brand new, never used in boxes. 700,000 rifles, 700,000 rifles, 70,000 vehicles, trucks, cars, Many of them armor-plated, many of them costing over a million dollars apiece, armor-plated. And this is what we left. So I said to him, said, General, so how can you do it so quickly? I've been told it would take years to... He said, well, sir, when they came in from Washington, we have to obey. They're our superiors, so we're not allowed to give our ideas. I said, that doesn't sound like a good system. He says, but that's the military system. They would come in and they would tell us what to do, even though we're here. And when you think about it, it's incredible, because the people we're talking about are incompetent, and the people I'm talking about are unbelievable soldiers. And the reason, if you'd like me to finish the story, the reason I tell you this is that we have an unbelievable military, okay? We just have some really bad leaders. So, so I think it's an important story, but, but I said, so, General, how are you going to do it in four weeks and they can't do it in four years? He says, well, sir, when they came in, they would only use this base. And this base is very far away. It's a big base. It's a main base. We gave it to China, by the way. You know who has that base right now? China. Because when they left, China has the base. And the reason we should have kept it, not for Afghanistan, we should have kept it because it's one hour away from where China makes its nuclear weapons, right? So we give it up. How stupid are these people? So anyway, so, General, Raising Cain goes, no, sir, uh, we can do it in four weeks. We can do it very quickly. I said, so what was the problem? Well, sir, they came in. I disagreed, but it's not for me to say. They came in, sir, and they, they said very strongly, we can only use the one base. Now, the one base is very far away. By the time we got there to the site, we had to turn around to refuel, come back. So they were going here. They had about two, two seconds, and now head back. Let's head back. And that's what we had. But we have portable, what we call portable bases, sir. We have a lot of portable bases. We have nine of them, at least, already up. And if we use our portable bases, I said, why didn't they? They said, well, they're located in some countries, and they would consider it not politically correct. But, sir, nobody would know where the hell these planes are coming from. I said, that's probably right. She said, they're politically correct. They want to be politically correct, so they didn't do it. So they had seven to nine bases. So he said, sir, what I'd do is very simple. I'd leave from here, but this is the least important. I'd supply from here. But I'd go out to all of these auxiliary or portable bases, and I'd hit them from the left. And sir, I'd hit them from the right, and I'd hit them from up above, and I'd hit them from right under their ass, sir. <laughs> and I'd hit them from so many directions, they wouldn't know what the hell is happening. And, sir, it'll be over very quickly. I say, I have to think about this, because nobody's ever told me this. Nobody's ever told me this. I said, I'll speak to you. I went back to Washington, and I spoke to him on Monday or Tuesday. 
And I said, you still feel you can do that, General? Absolutely, sir. I said, go ahead and do it. And he knocked the hell out of him, and he knocked him out. <laughs> knocked him out. Less than four weeks. And then I had to give an order because there were a lot of them that were cornered. He said, sir, we got cornered rats. I said, what do you mean rats? They're human beings. Hey, they're not human beings, sir. These people are, these are bad people, sir. These are really bad people. I said, uh, so what are you suggesting? He said, well, you let me know when the job will be completely finished. I said, well, that's a lot of people you're asking me about. You know, that's never been my thing. I build beautiful buildings, I do other things, right? He said, that's never really been, it's a lot of people. He said, they're not people, sir. So here, here's what you do. Take those gorgeous F-16s and fly over them for a while. Keep flying over them. Get those F-24s, F-22s. You fly over them. And maybe you'll scare the hell out of them and they'll surrender. They won't surrender, sir. They don't know what the surrender is. They don't know what a white flag is, sir. They don't surrender. Whether you like them or not, those son of a bitches, they will never, ever surrender. And I say, so what do you think? I said, here's what you do. Spend a little time flying back and forth. Let's see. He said, yes, sir, I'll do that, sir. And he did. He calls me up. Uh, sir, what do you want me to do? Well, did it have any impact? Absolutely none, sir. They don't care. They're prepared to die. I said, all right, you have to finish it off. He finished it off. And you know what? We got rid of ISIS, 100% of ISIS. And then, and then I took out al-Baghdadi, the leader of ISIS. So I knocked out al-Baghdadi, and then I also ended the life of the world's top terrorist, Qasem Soleimani, the father of the roadside bomb. Every one of you, and respectfully, I love you, but you, you too, uh, he made, he was the father of the roadside bomb, the bomb. And uh, he made them bigger, bigger, bigger. They kept getting bigger, bigger, and more sophisticated. 94% of the people that died or had legs or arms or faces obliterated, removed from their body, 94% was because of Soleimani. And I took him out, too. Bigger than any terrorist in the world. I went to Walter Reed on numerous occasions because to see the soldiers. And I've never been, uh, I would always say I could have never been a doctor because I can't handle that stuff, right? You know, I'm not, if I see somebody with a little finger, a little blood, I say, oh. And yet I was able to handle it so incredibly well because when I looked, I don't know, it was a different feeling of love or something, but I would go a lot. And I'd see these soldiers come back so badly wounded, so badly. Uh, the, by the way, the doctors at that hospital are unbelievable. They, what they can do. But, you know, some of these lives, the lives are so bad. One young man, he went to Princeton University. Princeton, he was a great student. He was actually, you know, family's well-to-do, I understand. He wanted to spend some time as a life experience. And he went to Princeton, and he got blown to pieces in his last day. He got lost both legs, both arms, and most of his face. And I walked into the room, and his parents were there grieving. I've never seen anything like it. They couldn't believe it. You know, this kid was like this perfect, handsome. They have a picture of him by the bed. You know, you see him, and he's so badly, horribly hurt. And they have a picture of him by the bed. Beautiful, handsome guy. I'd love to look like that. I said, God, I'd love to look like that. I told his parents, I said, boy, this is tough, huh? He said, we never thought this was possible. He wanted this before going to work on Wall Street. He was going to do this as a life experience. You know, I thought, life experience. Another one was a great young man. He was unbelievable with the roadside bombs. He was the best guy at finding them. And he had, you know, we had great equipment for it. We had the long, I don't know if you've ever seen them with the long rods, and they have, on the end, they have tremendous uh, equipment, computerized in every way, but the most incredible equipment. And he had a half a day to go, and he said, hey, I'll go with you guys into the field. And he went into the field. He said, I'll go with you. He's got a half a day. He's coming home. He's got a half a day. But he's friends with all these great soldiers, great people. And... Uh, so he spent his last, last half day there. They're going out and they're looking for roadside bombs, bombs. And he got the hell blown out of him. 
and like like you wouldn't like you wouldn't even believe. Honestly, uh, a few years before that, you could never save these soldiers. What they do, the you know the way, the way they can, what they can do to keep people alive today is so different than it was just a few years ago. It's incredible. In some cases, maybe maybe it's not even that good a thing because the lives are so horribly destroyed. But he went in and he was searching. And what happened is Soleimani was, all of his bombs were being detected by brilliant young guys and brave guys like this. And he came up with a new bomb, even bigger, but more importantly, Every single ounce of that bomb was made out of plastic. So the metal detector only detects metal. Every ounce of that thing, big, was made out of what's called hardened plastic. And it doesn't have to be that strong. Even the screws are plastic. They showed the screws are made out of plastic. Everything's plastic. So he's looking for metal. First day, they put him in. And he got blown up. Most of his friends died. And think of it, he could have left. He didn't have to go out with them that day. He went out and he lost his life. And that was Soleimani that did that. The king, the father of the roadside bomb, the biggest terrorist in the world. Nobody close. I mean, uh, Osama bin Laden wasn't even in that league. And he's killed so many people, not only soldiers, a lot of our soldiers, a lot of soldiers, but destroyed the lives of so many people. And so many people are walking around now without legs or without arms because we took him out. We got him. We got him. The Prime Minister of Pakistan told me, when I heard, and he was a friend of mine, very handsome guy, was a great athlete, and uh, Khan, Prime Minister, and I was with him, he said, I've won many awards. You know, he was the number one cricket player in the world, or just about number one. He was like, uh, take your best athlete, take a Tom Brady. He was like the Tom Brady of cricket, which, which over there, which over there is the biggest. They don't know about football. They know cricket, everything's cricket. They have stadiums. They build a stadium in India that holds 138,000 people. It's big. And he was just about the best player. Celebrated all over the world, but he retired. He ran for office. He won as a great celebrity and athlete. He said, when I heard that Soleimani was killed, he said, I believe it was the biggest day of my life. And he didn't say happiness or sadness. He said, I've never had an event so big as that. And when I heard that he was killed, he was feared all over the Middle East, feared. He was, as you know, from Iran. And it really set them back a long time. I believe that the mullahs, I believe that uh, the leaders of Iran actually were happy about it because they were afraid of him, very afraid of him. I believe, I may be wrong about that, but the prime minister told me that when I heard that Soleimani was killed, I walked to my house from my office and I stayed in my house and contemplated for one week I couldn't believe this happened. This was the biggest event in my lifetime. He said, you have no idea. And I was told that by one or two other leaders, too, something very similar. And, uh, and we took him out. And I think that's one of the reasons that I had no problem with Iran. Iran was broke when I was there. Not when I started, but when I finished. I told China, if you give Iran one dollar for oil, they have a lot of oil, if you purchase any oil, you're not doing business with the United States. And, and any business that gets through, we're going to tariff or tax you at 100%. So China didn't buy. I mean, you can look at this. You've got to look at the numbers. They went down. I had them down to almost nothing. You would have never had a problem for two reasons. Number one, they didn't have the money, but you would have had a deal. They wanted to make a deal. They were going to make a deal. They were broke. They said uh, the other day, one of the commentators, who was not a Trump guy at all, a very liberal guy, but he said, whether you like him or not, Iran was, he broke, he, he broke them. But he said they were broke. They didn't have any money. And you remember reading about it. They couldn't give Hamas any money. 
They couldn't give Hezbollah any money because they didn't have any money. Now they've got $100 billion plus $6 billion for a wonderful deal we made on, uh, think of the deal that we made. Five hostages, five hostages. I said, no. Oh. But then they said, well, that's not all. It's five and five, but they get $6 billion. Think of it. Just think how stupid. But the $6 billion is peanuts compared to the oil. You know, the $6 billion, it plays well, it reads well, and it's simple to understand, although nobody would do the deal. How stupid. But by the way, when they made that deal, I said, you're going to have now hostages captured all over the world. Because once you agreed, you know, I did 58 hostages. I got 58 people back, four of them from North Korea. That's tough. I got 58 hostages back for no money. We never paid money. Because once you pay money, you set a precedent where they're going to do it again and again and again. So it was, uh, it was a big thing. Thank you for watching this video. Live Feed is an independent media platform that's not affiliated with any party or organization. Our only mission is to bring truthful and independent reporting. If you'd like to support our work, join our channel as a member and be the first to watch all new videos as soon as they come out. Additionally, as a member, you will have access to many exclusive features, including priority reply to comments, access to behind-the-scenes footage, as well as members-only Q&As, polls, and more. Thank you for supporting independent journalism. People like you make it all possible. Live Feed. News as it happens. Worldwide.